Good morning. My name is John Anderson. I'm the Dean of the College of Engineering and Architecture. I apologize for my camera. We've had some technical difficulties, but I'm certainly glad that you're here and I would like to welcome you. At Howard University, our College of Engineering and Architecture has five departments. We have the Department of Architecture, Mechanical Engineering, Civil and Environmental Engineering, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, and Chemical Engineering. In all of our engineering disciplines, except for Chemical Engineering, we have doctoral programs. And all of our engineering programs and architecture programs are accredited. ABET in the case of our engineering programs and NAB in the case of our uh, architecture program. Our computer science program is continuing to grow like so many other computer science departments across the United States. And we're very pleased to partner with REI Systems to look at ways to continue the opportunities that are available for our students in general, as well as uh, to take advantage of some of the knowledge that they have gained over the years in the marketplace so that our students can be uh, industry ready when they graduate. So it's a pleasure to continue that collaboration and I look forward to today's talk and I hope that you are able to get a great deal from it as well. It is a pleasure to introduce Shyam Saloma, who is the CEO of REI Systems and uh, please welcome him. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Dean Anderson. Uh, the purpose of this series is to build a strong community around IT professionals in the government, in the private sector, as well as in the academia. We have this series of events, uh, and the sole purpose is to strengthen uh, the relationship between Harvard University and the government IT professionals in, in government as well as private industry. A little bit about REI. Uh, we are a mid-sized IT company, and uh, the best part of what we get to do is to serve public sector missions. Uh, we have been around for about 32 years. Uh, and the example I would give is that one of the missions that we recently got awarded for was for Department of Defense, uh, where we took needs processes across 15 different components and came up with a solution that allows them uh, to receive applications for SPIR and, and review and award these innovations. I'm really excited about the topic today with what's going on in terms of changing pace of technology, as well as shortage of talent, uh, to learn about the career paths that are available in the federal IT sector, and also what are some of the skills that are critical to be successful in that. So please allow me to introduce three distinguished speakers we have. I think we have uh, two of them online and we are expecting the third one to join us. I'll start with Gary Washington. He is the USDA Chief Information Officer. Before that, he was the CIO for the USDA Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. He also served as CIO and Director of the Information Technology Division for the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Services. Our second panelist is Mr. Christopher Alvarez. He serves as the Acting Chief Data Officer at the United States Department of Agriculture. In this role, he is responsible for developing strategies that enable USDA to fully leverage its data as a strategic asset, improving organizational decision-making and outcomes for citizens. He's also a member of the Federal Chief Data Officer Council, working with other CIOs, CDOs, to improve the use of data across government. Our third speaker is Mr. Jeff Johnson, He's a member of the Senior Executive Service and Services at 
the Deputy Chief Information Officer for Business Management and Planning at the U.S. Department of State, supporting a 2.7 billion global IT portfolio, servicing a 97,000 person workforce, operating in over 300 locations around the world. With that brief introduction, I want to ask uh, our panelists uh, to share their journey, their career path as they started their career uh, with our audience. Uh, and I want to point out when I looked at, there are about 125 folks registered for this webinar, uh, representing federal government, state and local government, academia, as well as uh, private sector. Mr. Washington, would you like to get us started on your journey and the career path that you experienced? Uh, thank you, Cheyenne, um, and thank, uh, thanks for having me on this panel today. Yeah, I, um, I started my career journey uh, in my service in the United States Air Force in the military. Um, you know, I, I started in IT uh, when they had things such as mainframes, and they just started out with um, these Zenith personal computers. Uh, so I spent 10 years in the military and, and, and learned a great deal about uh, information technology. Uh, after that, uh, I spent five years in private industry, uh, taking on various roles in private industry, uh, anywhere from uh, IT support to program management in that arena. Uh, after that, I have had various roles uh, in IT throughout the federal government, whether it be the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, Department of Treasury. Uh, I spent two years at the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, some time at uh, FDA. Um, I also spent um, two years at, in the Office of Management and Budget, an executive office of the president, where I had the uh, eternal efficiency and effectiveness portfolio in the uh, federal CIO's office. Uh, and all of that prepared me for the CIO opportunities that I've had that you mentioned in uh, NRCS, APHIS, and now I've been the, uh, the, the CIO of the Department of Agriculture for the, for the last five years. Um, there's really not many things that I haven't had an opportunity to take on uh, in IT in terms of uh, large projects or in terms of the level that uh, I've had to perform my duties. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited about where we can go with IT as a, in a, as a country, and, uh, you know, I look forward to your conversation today. Thank you. Mr. Alvarez, do you want to go next? Sure. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for having me. Um, my journey to uh, where I'm at today is, has been, uh, I think, one that's been a little bit uh, varied in approach. So uh, when I started uh, coming out of um, school at Johns Hopkins University, I was really interested in uh, science, biology, was looking to uh, a career in the medical field, um, and you know, really was kind of thinking along those lines, but very much from an, a science uh, and analytical perspective as well. Um, my first job out of school was in uh, starting in a small biotech company. Uh, doing a lot of genetic research, understanding how um, uh, genes can uh, predispose people to certain kinds of uh, disease risks, such as uh, um, certain cancers can be impacted differently by the types of genetic uh, mutations that are detected, and that can inform uh, treatments and uh, and outcomes and and um, uh, and how that uh, the uh, kind of the disease can be managed. Uh, I was very involved in the labs. We were doing, generating a lot of data about um, the various genetic variations that we see in, in different types of human diseases. Uh, we were able to file a couple of patents on um, uh, breast cancer genes that allowed us to really uh, help move forward in the industry and, and be able to provide these kinds of services to um, people in need. Uh, over time, that really uh, evolved a bit. You know, the biotech industry was really uh, exploding at that time. There were a lot of new opportunities um, and continued able to continue the work, uh, but shifted a bit. Uh, you know, because of the emerging technologies, 
I got very involved in things like data quality, quality control, uh, collecting data about our operations and how how to measure our um, performance and effectiveness. Uh, and that that led me to a, a evolution in my career towards data and analytics. Uh, I had some really great mentors at uh, a company I was at that um, really encouraged me to get additional training on statistics and statistical programming, um, got certificates in uh, advanced programming for SAS and, and uh, used uh, several other uh, analytics tools as well, um, and evolved my career into a, really an analytics one. Uh, became the director of analytics services for uh, the company I was at at the time, uh, and was working directly with pharmaceutical companies who really wanted to understand how genetics can inform their drug development, but weren't, you know, weren't really experienced in analyzing gene information. They were looking for uh, specialists, uh, people with a lot of expertise who could do that. So I, I led an, an analytics services uh, shop within this company. Um, we conducted a lot of genomic analyses, uh, looked at things like um, how drugs uh, were, uh, effective or ineffective potential drugs in treating diseases um, uh, and really built, a, I think, a, a pretty um, significant um, kind of impact with uh, these, these analytics groups. Uh, but I, had, at this point, spent uh, about a dozen years in biotech, um, uh, really liked what I was doing, did fascinating work, but also saw an opportunity to uh, look beyond you know, what I was doing today and start to explore some other opportunities. Uh, a, a chance opportunity came up at USDA. They were looking for a data analyst at the Food Safety and Inspection Service. Um, and I applied and got that position. Uh, and I think pretty quickly was able to, to have significant impacts and move up through the organization. Uh, I started as a branch chief uh, within about um, uh, six or seven years was director of uh, an analytics staff um, of about uh, 20 analysts, uh, as well as a number of contractors as well. Um, again, doing really interesting work. Our focus was on understanding the data that food safety uh, and inspection service generated to protect the food supply. Um, uh, that agency is responsible for uh, ensuring that uh, the meat and poultry that's produced in the United States are safe and wholesome for people to eat. Uh, that requires a lot of uh, inspection work. Uh, we have inspectors in plants every day uh, and they're recording their findings into information systems. And, and our team was really charged with digging into that data, understanding what we were seeing in, in terms of regulatory compliance um, and helping the, the inspection workforce and the, the agency make decisions about the best way to utilize resources, uh, looking for trends, uh, both good and bad, that would tell us uh, you know, where we needed to focus resources for um, inspection activities or uh, testing data to, to ensure that product wasn't contaminated. Uh, that was, again, a, a really great experience and opportunity for me to, to kind of develop uh, a, a team, to develop a, a workforce that uh, with analytics at the center of it, we overcame a number of challenges uh, with trying to get access to data um, and really, I think, helped transform that, that agency. And, and data analytics became very central to the day-to-day the -day operations, whereas in the past, it had been focused mainly on um, kind of uh, more on the fringe, uh, on the outside, doing analytics uh, where it was needed, but not really kind of centrally involved in the operations. And uh, during my time there, we we grew from about five staff to, like I said, about 20, um, and really were involved in um, the analytics and the development and deployment of algorithms that uh, helps the agency day in and day out. This led to another opportunity I had to join what was called the GSA Centers of Excellence. Uh, this was a effort, a collaboration with USDA and GSA to modernize um, different aspects of uh, IT, one being data analytics uh, in particular. And I was able to join the department under the leadership of, of Gary Washington um, and help to lead some modernization initiatives. We stood up enterprise analytics, we built departmental data visualization tools, putting access to information 
in the hands of the organization at all levels. We were building data products that the Secretary of Agriculture was seeing uh, at the same time as uh, county office directors out in, in counties across the country. Uh, and that's not something that really happened before. Um, so again, we, we uh, the modernization work we we're doing really started to change the culture of how we use data and how we put data in the hands of uh, folks throughout the organization, uh, but also externally. Uh, it evolved into uh, data sharing opportunities. How do we put data in the hands of the public, uh, address um, the needs of consumers, industry, businesses that uh, need government data to be able to understand um, uh, how services are being delivered uh, and how benefits are being uh, provided to Americans. Um, uh, that I think was a great opportunity for me, an opportunity to work at the department, to work across different uh, organizations. You know, FSIS was just one of 18 agencies at USDA, and now I've got an opportunity to work with every agency at the Department of Agriculture, working on things like um, uh, farm production, rural development, um, nutrition assistance programs, food safety, foreign agriculture and trade, uh, the variety of data that, that I get to work with, the, the, the variety of subject matter experts I get to work with has been just a, a great opportunity. Uh, and I, I've been able to do that and stay on in this role as uh, the deputy chief data officer and now acting chief data officer. Uh, really helping to, to identify technologies to help to grow the workforce uh, and expand the, the capabilities of the organization and do some analytics that has been challenging in the past. And I think that that sort of innovation and um, uh, modernization have been, uh, I think, really rewarding to me, I think really beneficial and impactful to the to the department and, um, you know, and, and is what I'm doing today. Uh, but you can see throughout my career, there's been you know some changes. I started with uh, a focus on science and medicine, shifted to data and analytics, um, moved from small biotech private sector to one of the biggest uh, federal agencies, uh, federal departments in government, um, all of which I think have have given me opportunities to grow, to expand my understanding, um, to take uh, and, and learn new ways to uh, not just do analytics, but uh, to work across an organization um, uh, and understand how how there are different ways of accomplishing uh, big goals and objectives. And so that's my my journey to where I'm at today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, would you take a few minutes to share your journey, please? Sure. Um... Uh, I, it, it is fascinating to hear other people's journeys, and we all have unique journeys in our, our careers, and, and, and mine is uh, vastly different from our two other uh, presenters. Um, I, I started my career at the National Security Agency um, and left the uh, National Security Agency to, to work for some uh, defense contractors here in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, doing uh, proposal work and, and working with NAVC and NAVAIR, building uh, Aegis warships. Um, after, and that, that was in my early 20s, I was going to school at night, uh, finishing up my, my degree, and um, and I didn't find it very rewarding. Um, and I started coaching basketball at the Boys and Girls Club of Washington, D.C. And, um, and from there, I, I realized that, uh, that I, I didn't enjoy what I was doing. There was no passion to the work that I was doing. Uh, but I loved coaching and, and tutoring uh, these 10 year olds. So I, I, I took time and uh, thought about it and, and then went and became a, a high school teacher. Uh, I taught high school for a number of years in, just outside of Annapolis, Maryland, um, as a social studies teacher. Um, and if, if you're looking for career growth and leadership skills, there's nothing like teaching a high school student, uh, trying to get them to be motivated to try to get them to uh, deal with uh, conflict resolution skills, uh, teaching about emotional intelligence, time management, preparation. All those skills actually um, were taught uh, for, for me. That, that was the, the, the biggest area where I, I learned the most was, was teaching high school. Uh, but after a while, I realized that I couldn't afford to live on a teacher's salary, um, and I applied and, and was able to get a 
position with the Department of Education. And in the Department of Education, I was working with Native American programs. Um, and within those programs, we were using cultural education to improve uh, academic uh, scores of, of Native students around the nation, um, and also increasing our, our teacher retention and, and, uh, and creating a professional workforce for teachers uh, across the nation. Uh, one day I was uh, sitting in, in my cubicle talking to a colleague, uh, complaining about the process, complaining about work that was being done and, and that it really had not much meaning. And my supervisor walked by and heard me. Uh, she pulled me aside and she said, uh, Jeff, uh, what are you going to do to improve things? You have the responsibility of the public service. Uh, and that statement from her, uh, it drove the rest of my career uh, ever since then. What are you going to do to make things better? Um, we all have a span of control. And from that, uh, I was able to take uh, a national assessment um, and create uh, data for uh, these programs, these cultural programs, to show that cultural education does improve academic scores of students and increases graduation rate. Um, and that was a really powerful feeling to feel that I was making a difference and that not only was uh, the Hill looking at this data, the local communities were using that data to improve their programs, their educational programs. Uh, from there, I went and, and, uh, and worked for OMB for a short period, and, uh, and then I came to the Department of State to work in uh, our Educational and Cultural Affairs program, uh, which is the Fulbright program uh, that many of you may be familiar with. Um, and working with cultural exchanges of, of people from around the world to come to the United States. Um, tap on the shoulder and uh, to, uh, to lead the grants um, work across the Department of State. Um, again, utilizing data, utilizing systems to drive that um, improvement to the way that we're doing our work. Um, from there, I went to HHS, uh, Health and Human Services, uh, leading the grant portfolio at HHS, and, uh, and most recently I came back to the Department of State. Uh, the draw to the international affairs community uh, is strong, um, and uh, I find this to be rewarding work. Uh, I came back here to work for what's called the Office of the Inspector General, uh, leading our inspections of uh, embassies and consulates around the world to determine uh, their operational effectiveness and efficiency. So we look at everything from security of the post to the IT infrastructure of the post to um, whether we're actually getting across our foreign uh, policies uh, in, in an appropriate and efficient manner. Um, and from there, uh, after a few years at the IG, um, and if you know anything about the Inspector General, they point out where everything's mistaken or where they, you need to have improvement within a system, uh, but they also um, don't resolve anything. They turn back to the, the offices to resolve. So. Uh, the, I, I, I enjoyed the finding and, and seeing where the gaps were within the organization, but I really wanted to get back into um, helping fix and uh, improve those systems. What are you going to do to fix things? That, that voice is always churning in my head. Um, and so I came to, uh, to what's called our Information Resource Management Office, as the Deputy Chief Information Officer for Business Management and Planning. And here I um, am responsible for uh, the budget, for um, our IT budget for, for the department, as well as uh, our strategic planning, um, our, our, our governance of how we um, identify systems, uh, our public reporting, um, our acquisitions, centralized all our acquisitions of one office, and then also uh, working with our strategic workforce planning. So how do you, how do we recruit uh, the appropriate people into the foreign service and into the civil service here at the department? As well, as how do we retain that talent within the organization? So, um, so long story, the meandering river of a career, but always looking for that opportunity and always looking when opportunity is brought to me uh, to, to, to take that and say, I, I'm up to the challenge, and I, I want to take that on. Um, so um, that's my, my career journey. Wow. 
such a diverse path to get to the amazing place you all are. Uh, I'm wondering, I notice uh, shifting from military, biotech, education to government. What was it that attracted you to go towards the government career? And any one of you can speak. I, I, I'll go, Sam. I, I think um, what what attracted me to uh, government work is, um, you know, being a public servant um, was important to me because, you know, I like public Ooh. service. But in addition to that, the opportunities, the diverse opportunities that uh, and the challenges that were presented uh, moving forward, um, you know, even in the Department of Agriculture, you know, we have over 114,000 uh, customers that we support and many, many, many um, diverse uh, activities that go on, um, you know, both domestically and internationally. So, you know, there is no shortage of opportunities to grow as a information technology professional uh, in USDA. Um, and, uh, you know, so, you know, whether it be, you know, what I went through uh, at the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms with learning how the law enforcement community does things and, and supporting them from an IT uh, perspective uh, or transitioning to uh, Health and Human Services and the Food and Drug Administration, where you support, you know, quite frankly, the FDA, a large number of scientists on a, on a daily basis, you know, or, or transitioning to USDA where as Chris said, you know, you have everything from foreign agricultural service to food safety to, you know, farm programs, you know, to, to, to forestry, you know, scientific computing, those kinds of things. So, you know, on a daily basis, um, you know, we, there, there's no shortage of challenges. Um, get opportunities to grow attracted me, you know, and, and just learning new things about, you know, what we, how we support people. Uh, as, as, a, as a government, you know, and how we support this country. Yeah, this is Chris. I, I think, um, you know, when I first joined the government, it, it really wasn't a um, sort of an intentional move on my part. I, I was looking for a change. You know, I'd been working in uh, like small biotech for uh, over a dozen years and really thought, you know, I was at a point in my career where I thought, you know, this is a good opportunity to try something pretty different from what I'm doing uh, today. And, and, you know, USDA and working for the government is was a pretty big change, you know, going from a small company of, you know, less than 100 people to uh, a federal agency of, uh, at times, over 100,000 people is a pretty uh, significant change. Uh, and one of the ones that I think, you know, I, I was looking for that kind of challenge. I was looking for um kind of a new uh kind of direction to to maybe to apply my skills in so still very interested in data and analytics um but wanted to get some breadth of scope and experience uh working in the government you know you would think and i think uh, oftentimes you know people think it's you know a, a bureaucracy that big it's easy to get lost uh, in there and um and not really have a chance to do meaningful work but uh, i found i think quite the opposite in a lot of ways. Um, when you think about the food supply uh, and the work that USDA does, it impacts every American um, uh, every day. And, you know, and when you think about how, how much of the USDA food goes abroad, uh, the global impact is, is really significant as well. Uh, having day-to-day -day, uh, contributions to that, to impacting the food that's on people's plate, uh, the businesses, the farmers that are uh, trying to you know, um, uh, produce those those food, those agricultural products, um, the the businesses that are trying to uh, um, provide safe and wholesome food, the restaurants, um, all of those groups uh, and organizations, the schools. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about education. A big part of the, the school lunch program comes from uh, USDA programs. Uh, you know, having that ability to to impact a lot of different uh, aspects of 
uh, everyday life, I think is is really meaningful. And there is just a tremendous community of of uh, workers that really uh, are committed to their job. Uh, they want to work with you. They want to uh, improve how we do business and how we do operations. Uh, and I think it creates a real opportunity to to work collectively um, to accomplish some really big things. And so. Uh, that's what I saw as really uh, valuable to working in the government and, and particularly with USDA. Thank you, uh, Mr. Johnson. And I also wanted to invite the audience to please go ahead and uh, enter their questions in the uh, questions box so that uh, we can get to those questions also. Thank you, Johnson. Sure. I, I, and I, I think I, I'm just building a, a on what Gary and Chris have st stated, uh, it, it's that public service that, that was important to me to be able to find a way to to be able to give to my community, uh, to 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 everyone across the nation. So, uh, being involved in uh, in local government supporting, uh, but also the support for uh, for national level approaches. Um, and to be able to see that you can make a difference in in a local mm -hmm. community through the assistance um, and support of of the federal government has it, has been really rewarding for me personally. Um, so uh, the the and the the quality of people that you meet um, across the federal government is 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 amazing. Uh, the, the dedication people provide to give to their Positions and to the, to the program they're supporting is by far um, by far no other industry that I've seen gives the way that federal workers give for the betterment of their fellow citizens, um, the supports for their fellow citizens. Uh, there is tremendous opportunity. Uh, you can grow in different directions. My career is a, an example of that where you can uh, try different avenues. Try different approaches uh, to to make that that difference and, and really have an impact on on, on our fellow citizens. So um, I, I, it it is all about the the public service and supports. Um, there's challenges, of course, with any position. You're always going to find that uh, that there's the day to day uh, challenges, um, but you find a way to 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 put that to the side. And really think of, of what we're trying to do. What's what's the mission? What is what is the goals that we're trying to achieve? And how do we do that in an efficient and effective manner for our, um, our fellow citizens? Thank you. The common theme seems to be public service and making a difference. Uh, that's truly awesome. Uh, since our audience had, I will ask two more questions, and then uh, we'll go to questions from the audience. Uh, since we have folks who are in the government, state and local, federal already, and also from the academia, my first question is, what advice would you give to students who are just graduating uh, based on your experience and uh, reflection? Mr. Johnson, do you want to start? <laughs> sure, let's go back the, the opposite way this time. Um, uh, so, advice for someone starting off is 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 getting your foot in the door uh, first, mm -hmm. um, and whether that is a contractor or in in federal service, it's getting your foot in the door and know that every day is a learning experience. Um, every opportunity that's put in front of you is a learning opportunity. I'm sure I'm not alone that I've had horrible bosses, I've had struggling programs. I've had um, times when we weren't financed appropriately. We, we didn't receive the budget we expected. We were understaffed. All of those were learning experiences that you bring forward as you're moving forward in your career that you can you learn from and grow from. So just continuing that mindset that this is not the end of my journey. This is a part of my journey. This is who I am becoming as a person and, and really getting to know and understand your core values. Don't just accept any position that comes your way. Think about your core values. When you get into a position, know that you you are in control of your destiny. Uh, 
Nobody can tell you where you are going to go with your career. Um, so don't feel empowered all the time. Uh, you can continue moving forward. Um, if you have a, a boss that is uh, that is overly demanding, doesn't give you information, think about all those things uh, that you're learning from them that you want to change when you become the boss. Uh, one of the things that I've learned is uh, I didn't like non-communication. So communication has become a really important thing to have overly, overly, overly communicate what the goals and missions are and have that, uh, that sense of belonging for staff and making everyone feel like they're part of a, an integrated team uh, with uh, achieving whatever mission. Mm. Nice. Thank you. Um, this is Chris. I can uh, share some thoughts as well. I think uh, I think getting your foot in the door is is a great start. I, I think also uh, flexibility. You may not end up uh, with the first job you applied for. You may you know there's I think a pretty competitive process to uh, hiring in the federal government as well. So don't be discouraged if uh, it doesn't work out the first time. Uh, I would say you know keep driving towards it. Uh, you know as I've applied to uh, positions over the years, you know, you learn um, uh, each time how to do that better and more effectively uh, so that you can get your foot in the door and get started. Uh, the other, th uh, I think, thing that I think is is really important to keep in mind, particularly with federal government, is the, the learning opportunities don't stop with, um, uh, with a, a career. So uh, in government, the, 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 training, the detail opportunities, the opportunities to go spend 90 days working in this other part of the organization, understanding how they operate and learning their skills um, is, I think, a real asset to um, uh, a career in, in federal government. I think the ability to uh, get to see how uh, someone across the hall or in the next building works uh, and be able to spend some time really working in those positions uh, helps you. Uh, it helps you understand your customers. It helps you understand who your partners are that you're working with, uh, and helps you to deliver and align uh, the work that you're doing towards their needs as well. Um, it also helps you know to share your expertise and experience with them. Um, so I think that's what I see as really um, uh, an advantage, a, a strategic value for work in the federal government is. Um, this ability to really broaden your your horizons, be able to try different things, um, uh, and do it in a in a very I think um, encouraging and productive work environment. Yeah, now um, you know I I think both Jeffrey and Chris are absolutely right, and I'll just add that um, you know once you get your foot in the door, you know um, if don't be scared. I mean you know take on challenges. Um, you know, if you don't think you know something, then, you know, you'll have opportunities to figure it out, you know, and don't be scared to ask questions. I've, I've been in situations where I have been asked to do things and, you know, I, I, ba I basically had to figure out, you know, how we're going to get these things accomplished. But those are opportunities that help you grow and, and, and um, expand your toolkit um, as, as a leader and, you know, as a professional. Um, you know, I would ask a lot of questions. Uh, I would not be scared to uh, take on difficult tasks, you know, and, and work within large teams as well. Uh, I, you know, I would just, you know, I'm echoing what, it, what has already been stated, but there, there's a large amount of opportunities, especially uh, now uh, in the federal government with, you know, the emphasis on new and emerging technologies and data. Uh, if, if I were going to, you know, starting off, uh, this is an exciting time. Thank you. Uh, I will ask the second question that came to me, given our audience, and then we'll see if audience has uh, their questions. What hurdles did you face as you started your career in the federal IT sector, and uh, how did you overcome those hurdles? Mr. Alvarez, you want to go first this time? Sure. Challenges that I faced. Uh, 
Well, I'll, I'll share. Uh, one of the biggest challenges I faced was when I first started uh, in government. Uh, the first week that I was uh, here, um, my direct manager, it was her last week in that position. Uh, she was moving on to a new role. Uh, so within the first week, my management had changed. Um, uh, by the third week, uh, we had a, a national meeting that we were presenting um, some analytics results to, and the speaker, the presenter for that had to back out. Uh, and I got asked uh, at the last minute to um, come speak at this national meeting uh, with press, uh, the Secretary of Agriculture, industry trade groups, um, you know, still learning things about uh, meat production that uh, were fundamental, you know, the basics, the 101 of, um, uh, of the Food Safety Inspection Service. It was challenging. And I was, uh, you know, really trying to learn things as quickly as possible. I was working um, tremendous amount of hours just to understand the subject matter uh, here till um, at, at times 10 or 11 o'clock. Uh, before I would go home. Uh, on the one hand, that was that was challenging. Uh, it made me wonder uh, what I was doing in government and whether I had bitten off more than I can chew. At the same time, though, I had a really supportive um, uh, group around me. I had, you know, I mentioned I was here working really late hours. I had people that were staying here with me, uh, working with me, training me on um, the subject matter, helping me understand uh, the material for this this upcoming meeting. Uh, so you know the people around me were as committed uh, to to the success of um, this meeting and myself as uh, as I was. And so uh, very challenging, but also I think a great opportunity. Uh, I think throughout the career, you know other challenges you run into is that you have you you are working with a big organization, and you know it represents diversity of thought, diversity of opinions. Um, and oftentimes, you know, you have to navigate those. Uh, sometimes the, the direction that your organization wants to go in is, is not, uh, um, not always what I think is personally is, is the best direction to go in. Uh, we always have to find the kind of the, the best um, solution for everyone involved. It requires negotiation. It requires collaboration. Um, it requires the ability to, to compromise and to find a solution that's a win-win. Um, and in, in government, I think that there's uh, a, a real strong need for that, to be able to understand um, the different perspectives. Uh, when you talk about providing government services, um, you know, just one other example I'll share with the Food Safety and Inspection Service is that uh, we had consumers who were very interested in um, meeting with us and talking about steps we could do to strengthen and tighten up uh, the safety of the food supply. We also had industry wanting to um, know what the agency is doing to help small businesses uh, stay in business and keep producing. Um, and, and at times those, those were opposing forces and we had to find uh, you know, what was appropriate and, and the middle ground uh, to move forward. Uh, at the department level, uh, having worked now in, in managing data, we have uh, you know, a lot of um, questions about, you know, what are you doing with this data? Uh, this is my data. I, you know, I don't want to give it to uh, someone else. When in reality, uh, most of the data we have is data that belongs to the entire department and to uh, the people through uh, FOIA requests. Uh, nearly all the data that USDA has is uh, is shareable to the general public. Uh, helping to, to really manage those expectations. Um, uh, and and uh, utilize our data for the benefit of uh, broader audiences uh, really has been at times a challenge, but at times also a great success when we've been able to move forward. I, I would just say, um, as, as you um, progress in your career, uh, you go from thinking one way to having to think another. And what I mean by that is, you know, most IT professionals are very technical in their um, first the initial journey on their IT um, careers. But as you progress and if you're going to be successful, 
uh, at some point you may need to make a transition to speaking um, like a business person uh, about information technology and, and being sensitive to uh, the audience that you're uh, speaking to. Uh, and that was a transition for me. Um, you know, as I uh, moved up and worked on more visible programs, uh, I had to, to be able to communicate um, properly and express myself properly to, to different audience, audiences. And um, that also, um, you know, meant speaking as well as thinking strategically about, about IT, information technology. Um, you know, as Chris said, um, diversity of thought of thought is very important because everybody's not going to think like you. That was a hurdle, also. So you have to be open to, you know, other people's point of view, um, you know, as well as compromise, you know, on an on an approach, as well. And and as you go throughout your journey, you'll meet different people from different backgrounds that have many different ideas. Uh, you know, and I think it's important to understand where they're coming from also, you know, so as you can, you know, you know what you're dealing with and you'll have a better understanding is how you can work with people to ensure that everybody uh, is, is successful because nobody's going to get 100% what they want all the time. But at some point, um, you have to get over these hurdles and, and be able to, you know, think strategically uh, to speak to a broader audience in a, in a manner that makes them feel comfortable as well. Thank you. And I, just to Gary, I sort of hit on all, all the points that I was I was thinking of about uh, that. I, I come from a, a different background, so I come from a non-technical background, and I'm coming into a technical position. Um, and one of the things that I've seen is is that 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 issue of uh, of translation. Coming from a, a, a business background, um, being able to translate that into the technical side and having our, our technical folks that are you know, experts in cloud computing, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, mobile technology, all those areas are vital to ensuring that we have the right um, infrastructure in place to support our diplomats overseas. But at the same time, we have to be able to communicate what the business cases are. We need to make sure, I, I call it the three S's, we need to make sure that everything we discuss to the Hill, to our, our budgeteers within the department, we make sure that the, the, those three S's, it, it's simple. Um, and, and I don't mean elementary, but it, we, we say it in plain language. We simplify the language so that we're not talking technical all the time. Uh, that it's supportive, that it's not just the new and, and the newest technology or the new, uh, idea that's on the block, but it's really supportive of the mission. And then uh, something Gary also mentioned, strategic. We, 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 have, we all have limited budgets. We all have limited approaches. Um, so how can we strategically apply it so that we're meeting the mission, um, getting the best value for our dollars, and being on the cutting edge of that technology? So uh, having that interpreter uh, to go between uh, the, the technologist, the budgeteer, the, the data analyst uh, is really a, a vital role that I, I found myself playing more in. Um, we all are um, involved in technology. I, we, as far as the Department of State goes, and I think every federal agency, we can't do our job without technology. You need to have outlets. You need to have teams. You need to have these analytical tools to be able to break down large amounts of data to say what, you, what services you're providing and meeting the mission of the, of the department. So how do you do that in such a way that's efficient, that's effective, and that we all are understanding what that is and, and driving towards that, that ultimate goal? So uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, I've seen is, is just that interpret and interpreting the data. And also for IT professionals, what I've seen also is this, uh, the focus on the their expertise in there, and um, and we don't build enough about those soft skills that, that you need in order to become um, to 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 move into leadership positions. The soft skills, problem solving, critical thinking, interpersonal skills. Um, how do you how do you build that critical, creative, innovative mindset 
um, but still keep that technical side and not always go to the technical side when that's your that's your your safe area. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, it makes a lot of sense. You know, as technical people, we start off our career focused on technology, but the things that you all mentioned around the soft skills, the flexibility, looking at the business aspects of it, communication skills are so critical for your success. Uh, Jeff, uh, if you have any questions from the audience, can you please uh, share that with the panel? Sure. Uh, Margaret Johnson had a question for a person who's in the middle of their career in the private sector, in particular in health, and is interested in uh, federal opportunities. Where can someone who's kind of mid-career jump in and make a contribution uh, if they have IT experience in a relevant domain in the private sector? Well, I'll, I'll try to answer that. Um, so it, it, in, in terms of opportunities at USDA, um, I would just say that our uh, we have a gigantic focus on data and data analytics. We're trying to transition um, you know, towards artificial intelligence, things like machine learning. Uh, I think any professional, um, you know, given, given, the, uh, given the focus on data across the federal government, I think that would be a very exciting uh, career field for uh, someone to to step, you know, to 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 think about. Um, in addition to that, uh, cybersecurity is um, there's no shortage of opportunities in cybersecurity. Um, I, I think government wide, we need um, we need very good cyber technologists um, as well. Um, but within uh, there is another area that we don't talk about a lot where there's a shortage of, of, of people um, and it's, it's a business arm of IT, which is around portfolio management, uh, project management, uh, enterprise architecture, those uh, functions that help you manage a portfolio as, as, as large as, as USDA's. Um, we, we oversee uh, a $2.8 billion IT portfolio and we have to account for all of that. And as many, there's many business-like functions uh, that, that go into managing that portfolio, um, you know, such as IT strategic planning, managing audits, those kinds of things. And those are turning out to be uh, unique skill sets that are very hard to find, uh, especially someone that's very good at them. So, um, you know, those are opportunities, I, I think, specifically at USDA, um, that, that I think, you know, we would be excited to recruit new talent in. Uh, I'll let uh, Chris talk more about the data since he's the CDO here at USDA. But, um, you know, th those are some of my thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Gary. I think uh, when I think a little bit about um, the, the question, you know, shifting mid-career, uh, it's not too different from uh, what I was doing. Uh, I was, you know, spent, uh, a uh, good amount of time in, in private sector and move to federal government. I think one thing that um, uh, is important to think about there is, is what, what strengths, what assets or strategic uh, or skills do you bring um, that, are, uh, that maybe don't exist in the government today? I think oftentimes, you know, private sector industry tends to be uh, a bit ahead of the government in terms of adopting some of the uh, cutting edge technologies um, new initiatives and such. And so there may be experiences that you're bringing from the private sector that are valuable to government. Um, you know, as Gary said, there's, there is a move towards adopting some of these new technologies, cloud, uh, cloud computing, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, big data analytics, uh, geospatial analytics in, in, in even bigger ways than we've done in the past. Uh, sometimes, you know, some of the best skill sets come from People coming out of the private sector that can bring that kind of uh, industry experience to the government and um, and really lead it forward. So I think someone who's who's got that kind of background brings a unique set of of talents and expertise that others don't. It can give you a competitive advantage in the application process. Um, uh, 
Uh, and I would just, I would encourage you to, to sort of look at what you're doing and, and think about um, how it's uh, maybe above and beyond or different from uh, what you see in government today. Uh, and those are areas that I think present uh, opportunities for you. Yeah, and, and I, I, I couldn't agree with Kristen very much on, on that approach. Um, I, I also think the you, you're going to be spreading the, the the net pretty wide, so you're going to be utilizing USA Jobs. Um, you're going to be looking at uh, agencies that that really uh, connect with you um, and connect to the mission, uh, uh, and so. Taking that that broad look is important, uh, but also not being too narrow in your focus. There is plenty of opportunity across various sectors within um, within federal agencies in order to get employed. I think portfolio management that Gary mentioned is, is, is absolutely a vital and, 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 and an area that we need to strengthen uh, within government. So uh, there's plenty of uh, positions available across that, um, and then there's the more technical type cybersecurity areas uh, where there's needs for that. So um, be sure to attend uh, any any conferences. The conferences are more online nowadays. You can uh, make connections there. Um, just use all the resources you have. Um, one thing that I, I found is it's, it's really important. We, we sometimes forget the network of, in, of professionals we know around them. Um, even if uh, professionals and neighbors. Uh, sometimes your 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 neighborhood, you, you you just walk in the dog and uh, you strike up a conversation, and, and you'll find uh, that that you have something in common, or or they they're aware of something that uh, that may be uh, strike you as an opportunity. So um, you know, uh, be sure to utilize those networks uh, to support uh, your job search. Um, keep looking at USA Jobs. Look at all the um, look at all the specifics of your US a job uh, announcement. Uh, make sure that you follow that uh, the description and and what they're looking for. Uh, all that uh, that approach that they've they've outlined. And complete all the forms um, and really tailor your messaging to uh, to that specific job announcement. Um, and that, so that's all the advice I have. Thank you. Jeff, is there any other question from the audience? Uh, then I had uh, one or two more questions for the panelists. Why don't you go with one of your show and then I'll, I'll find out the next one that looks like it's not duplicative. Okay. So you all mentioned uh, several fields like uh, cybersecurity, data analytics, AI, importance of the soft skills. But sometimes I wonder with the pace that technology is changing, over the next 10 years, uh, you know, the importance of the soft skills, analytical flexibility, that's always there. But are there some specific areas in addition to what you mentioned to get your foot in the door uh, uh, and be engaged with the career in, in federal IT? What skills would you say are the most important? I would I would say, um, given where um, you know we view IT is going in terms of there's a, a convergence more and more with the business side of the house, um, especially when you talk about data and some of the things that um, you know artificial intelligence and machine learning bring to the table. Um, you know your soft skills for IT professional are more important than ever now in terms of working with your business colleagues and trying to um, come up with the um, specific application for these solutions. Um, you know, you need to be able to speak in a language that they understand um, and identify and speak to them clearly about the benefits of what you're trying to achieve, um, you know, and what it's going to take to get you where you need to be. Um, you know, I, I really don't think especially at a more junior level, it's becoming imperative that you be able to have an analytical mindset uh, in, in terms of what you do um, and be able to think creatively uh, about, you know, implementing uh, these uh, new, new, new approaches, 
to delivering solutions. So, you know, you know, your soft skills are important. Um, creativity is important. Um, I would not, especially today in IT with how IT uh, changes so quickly, I would not pigeonhole myself in one specific area and, and be open to learning many different areas. Um, you know, in terms of skill sets, I think, um, you know, the analytics of it, especially on the business side of IT is becoming more and more important. Um, more and more senior leaders are starting to inquire, especially with the environment that we work in now with uh, remote work and telework and, 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 and people not coming into the building. Uh, they want to know, you know, more and more about costs. They want to know more and more about, you know, you know, you know how is what what is the uh, what is the return on investment? What is the benefit? So you know, I would also say the soft skills and and the analytical mind and being able to apply that, you know, because execution is important also. Uh, it are important right now. I think uh, this is Chris. Just to build upon that a little bit, I think the. Um, you know, when we talk about the, the ability to communicate and to be able to um, get your point across to uh, oftentimes non-technical folks, um, you know, I think that applies not just to kind of how you speak and how you talk about the work that you're doing, um, but also in the data products themselves. Uh, some of the most impactful things we've done uh, as far as putting information in the hands of our senior leadership and managers has been uh, very visual, interactive tools, things like dashboards, uh, maps. Um, uh, you know, we're moving away, I think, generally from table, tabular reports. Uh, you know, it's one thing to be able to create a table uh, doing through your analysis or to, to calculate a, a p value and, and tell someone whether a difference is significant or not, but being able to, to illustrate that. Um, graphically and visually, I think is going to be uh, a real strong uh, skill set that uh, will, will kind of set you up for uh, a good career in the future. Um, I think there's a greater shift towards uh, citizen science types of, of initiatives. Um, mm -hmm. So having a uh, capability with you know Python or R, some of these, I, I think, analytics tools that are, are taught pretty commonly in, in universities today um, are a bit of a gap in the federal government. Uh, and so some of the best, you know, natural language processing, text mining algorithms, uh, geospatial algorithms are in, are being built in some of these tools that uh, are not as easy for um, uh, government to implement without uh, the right kinds of skill sets and, and bringing in some uh, some new workforce that really understands how to work with these these kinds of programs and tools, uh, how to apply new technologies, how to work with big data, how to do analytics using uh, cloud technologies. Uh, those kinds of skill sets are, uh, I think, still uh, evolving and emerging, emerging within the government. And so uh, I think those are areas to focus on. Um, but again, I think you know, a, a broad, uh, a uh, set of capabilities, the ability to to learn new things, uh, I think is going to be important to be able to stay uh, fresh and and uh, uh, contributing to the organizations. We've got um, just too many examples where we're running on the same technology that was brand new 30 years ago or so, and um, you know technology is evolving too quick for us to to kind of be able to rest on that kind of capability going forward or technology. So uh, we need to be able to evolve. We need folks who can stay abreast of the latest technologies, um, take advantage of some of these new uh, uh, tools that are out there for visualizing data or applying um, open source tools, algorithms uh, that the government can take advantage of and be able to use in their day-to-day -day work. And at the Department of State, we have, we have um, two tracks into the Department of State. One, one is civil service, um, which is more traditional IT shops, or um, expertise in cloud computing and, and, um, and cybersecurity. 
and engineering. Um, but we also have what's called the, the foreign service uh, and foreign service officers, and, and those um, those positions are are posted uh, at, at embassies and consulates around the world, um, and we provide that specific training for those individuals once. Uh, they are admitted into the Foreign Service uh, to, to travel overseas and, and be posted at the, at the embassy. Um, and they um, have uh, broad responsibilities at, at the embassies. Um, and, um, and so um, a lot of those soft skills are, are and, and the hard skills we, we train uh, those Foreign Service officers over a, a, a couple of months. Um, time periods in order to prepare them for uh, their duties when they are um, when they're posted to um, to an embassy. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jeff. Any question from the audience that you have? Yeah, there was one other uh, from Jean who says essentially, do you see a significant change in the federal IT workforce with the possibility of remote work? you know, kind of the post-pandemic era? Well, this is Chris, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. I, I do see some changes happening. I, I think, you know, on the one hand, the, the work of federal agencies needs to continue. And fundamentally, I think uh, uh, the goals and objectives of a job position stay very similar. Um, at the same time, though, remote work has uh, has changed at times how we go about doing that. Uh, when I think about analytics, even 10 years ago, a lot of the, the analytics work that um, analysts were doing in federal government was on laptops, uh, which means if you're if you're not in the office, you're you're pulling data over the networks, you're trying to do um, analytics on uh, laptops that, that generally aren't sized or, or, or designed for analytics. Um, so I think this this remote work uh, environment that the, the pandemic has really, I think, accelerated um, has led to, to you know, needs to be able to do this work on um, you know, cloud infrastructure, to, to not have to kind of um, have the, the applications or the data on your local machine where you're working or where you're remotely uh, located. So uh, I think there's a real advantage to being able to work in these environments. Um, you know, it accelerates the the productivity of, of the workforce. Um, uh, it provides for greater security of data and, and the work that we're doing. Uh, so I see those as areas where this remote workforce has, has started to shift how we utilize uh, IT in the organization. Um, just taking advantage of uh, uh, like enterprise tools, tools that are uh, more at the uh, server level, the cloud computing level, um, is becoming a, a greater need across the organization, uh, and and analysts are having to shift in that direction. Uh, so it's a it's a transition for all of us. There was one more question that I thought might be interesting, both to you and to the audience members. Audience member asks, not quite in so many words, I'm kind of looking for a job. Are you all hiring? Um, th this is Gary Washington. Let me say this. Uh, yes, uh, we are hiring. Um, and we are hiring for, um, you know, our skill set, people who want to learn new skill sets for our future. Um, as, as Chris said, you know, you know, just like any other government agency, um, we do have old technology, but we're working through that. Um, but uh, you know, you know, like we said before, you know, a big um, the big focus for us is data, obviously, cybersecurity, and uh, how we manage our business of IT. Uh, really, um, is, is 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 a great focus of ours, and we are looking to modernize the skill sets of our IT workforce. So. Uh, we are we are hiring, and there's many opportunities across many diverse missions at USDA. So uh, again, there there's no shortage of learning opportunities. 
Yeah, I, I would echo that. I think uh, uh, data analytics and IT are um, just critical jobs in the government. Um, just in the past, uh, I think, a uh, couple of months, uh, Office of Personnel Management uh, released some new job series around data scientists. So one thing I would recommend is go and, and look at that data scientist job series. Look at what the expectations are uh, for those kinds of positions uh, and look at where your skill sets align to that. Um, and then you know, take advantage of some of the, the features of USA Jobs. You can create alerts that notify you when positions get announced. Um, uh, and so you get that uh, in your inbox as, as those positions come out. Uh, there was a really interesting hiring event uh, last year with, with data science. It was government-wide where um, uh, we, uh, you know, a number of agencies needed to hire uh, data analysts and data scientists, and the General Services Administration facilitated a government-wide hiring activity where, um, uh, where we got several hundred, I think close to 400 applicants, uh, and over 100 people hired off of those. Uh, at different federal agencies. It was really, in some ways, a different approach than more traditional uh, hiring practices in the government, uh, but also an example of where we're looking for uh, novel approaches and novel ways to fill um, uh, particular needs broadly across the organization. We've done similar ones with uh, customer experience as well. Um, so look for those broad opportunities, those government-wide announcements, but I'd say you know, look at what some of these jobs are, are looking for as skills and um, keep an eye out on, on USA jobs as uh, these announcements come out. Yeah, in the Department of State, we're hiring uh, also in, uh, in, in, in two tracks, the, the civil service, which would be on USA jobs, as, as well as the foreign service to begin that process, USA jobs. Uh, they are... Uh, they, they both are, um, we're trying to become more efficient in the way that we're hiring uh, and, it, it, and try to reduce the amount of time that it takes from the um, from the time you apply uh, to the time you are uh, onboarding. Uh, one of the challenges we have is uh, security clearances. Uh, so that can uh, create a, a time lag for uh, new employees uh, coming on board. Um, so uh, you should take that into consideration uh, if you're looking to apply for the jobs. But it's um, it's a unique agency. Uh, we cover um, uh, various missions from uh, clean oceans to democracy building to educational cultural uh, exchanges uh, to, to, uh, to political and economic uh, improvements across Across the world, so um, it's it's a it's a it's a great opportunity to work for a wonderful agency that has a it is the oldest uh, cabinet level agency, um, but uh, the, the process all begins with the day job. Shem, there was one more interesting question, perhaps the last from the audience, then you can ask one as well. Um, and this one was uh, maybe playing a little bit more hardball, uh, keeping in mind that probably 30 or 40 percent of the folks who registered for this session are employees of the federal government. The question from Michelle was, what are you doing to help upskill the, uh, the capabilities of people who are already federal employees? And I know there are lots of things you're doing, but kind of what are the one or two maybe most important things that you might mention? Yeah. Um in, in USDA, um, we've had many programs to um, upskill our current employees. Um, we uh, put on uh, two or three different sessions to train employees on robotic process automation. Uh, we did that through a, uh, the Centers of Excellence that Chris talked about and in partnership with OMB. Um, uh, we sponsored a, um, a, a leadership development um, opportunities through the uh, Senior Executive Canada Development Program for people who wanted to be uh, Chief Information Officers or Chief Information Security Officers. We also did that with OMB. Um, you know, we have virtual training online uh, that people take advantage of. Um, it's, it's, we, we have uh, trainings in, um, you know, data 
that Chris mentioned, uh, you know, because I work with the federal, I'm on the federal CIO council and I'm on the IT working group subcommittee. And there are many different uh, opportunities that we provide our employees, specifically in USDA, with um, to upskill them and ensure that they're in a situation where they can be productive and prepare for the future. Um, but I will say this, um, in regards to that, um, you know, it's, it's up to the individual to take advantage of these opportunities. So we try to give everybody an opportunity to uh, come along with us on this journey, you know, in terms of where we're going in the future. Yeah, on the on the analytics front, I think um, uh, we've we've tried a couple of approaches. Some are more specific trainings, uh, so we'll uh, we'll conduct a training, uh, record it, and we'll post it for our workforce to be able to to uh, follow that same training uh, in the future. We've also been able to to um, give people opportunities to keep those skills fresh. So uh, we've done some uh, competitions, some Kind of hackathon style uh, events where we take a uh, a data set from USDA um, and we ask people to to show us how you would visualize this data. Um, it gives folks an opportunity to partner with maybe more experienced uh, folks. It gets gives them the opportunity to uh, showcase some of their skills and and learn from their colleagues and partners. Uh, and then uh, in a broader sense, we've also organized within USDA communities of practice. We have a, a data visualization and a data analytics community of practice. And, and they talk about um, how different parts of the organization are doing analytics, whether it's geospatial analytics, uh, text mining, um, risk assessments, risk analysis, uh, even into areas like um, uh, data management and data governance. So you know, those communities of practice are learning opportunities they help connect you with people who are really subject matter experts in areas. Uh, and that gives you, I think, some of those network connections that we talked about earlier, um, opportunities to reach out and, and learn from some of that. We're also trying to promote things like code sharing um, uh, so that you know someone who, who writes some uh, code to do a particular task can share that with other parts of the organization. So all of these are, you know, they're not necessarily ones that require a like a formal classroom uh, style training like we might think about in the past, but um, you know, opportunities to collaborate, to work collectively, to learn from each other, uh, to share knowledge, I think are, uh, are some really good training opportunities and development opportunities that, that we've tried to promote at USDA. Yeah, and at the Department of State, uh, we have some similar programs. We have communities of practice. Uh, we try to bring together uh, people within uh, like minds uh, to to learn and, and support each other and share our best practices across the organization. We also are, are are unique in that we have a an institute called the Foreign Service Institute, and that is our um, that is our driving educational uh, arm of the department. Um, and and there we um, we give all workers within the department uh, a, a clear avenue for for skill development uh, within the organization. Um, and we recruit trainers for that. And we have a, a so the, the Foreign Service Institute is broken into different schools. There's um, there's sort of a management side, contracting, and that sort of stuff. We have language services where people are learning uh, different language skills when they go overseas. Um, but we also have a technology uh, branch uh, and school that, that teaches all, all the uh, new emerging technologies, data skills. Uh, that are hired in order to perform our jobs, but also to enhance our, our jobs and, and move us to that cutting edge or over the horizon um, areas that we, we need to be moving towards as, as an organization. Great. Uh, being respectful of the time, I know we have only three, four minutes left. Uh, I wanted to see if Dean Anderson would uh, uh, close uh, this session. I just want to thank uh, you all for taking your precious time. Your insights have been very helpful, uh, especially for people who strive to get into the federal IT uh, game and be successful like you all have been. Uh, so thanks a lot for your time.
Dean Anderson, would you like to close the session? Certainly, thank you. And uh, I'd like to echo uh, Shim's comments and that we're very appreciative for the time that you have taken and for the information that you've shared. I'm sure our students will benefit greatly. I had the opportunity to serve as a program manager at the National Institutes of Health, and I can recall very vividly how much my colleagues were very serious about the work that they did, just as you have echoed in terms of serving the public and serving the greater good. And we like for our students to hear uh, your stories because uh, we would like for them to see all the possibilities that are there uh, for their careers, particularly those with the interest in IT, computer science. So you sharing your stories and the opportunities really benefits our students directly because uh, there are just many more opportunities sometimes in the brand name companies, if you will, that sometimes they may immediately latch on to. And then these careers can be extremely rewarding, interesting, and uh, beneficial. So we appreciate it, Mr. Washington, Mr. Alvarez, and Mr. Johnson for your time. And um, uh, we hope our students are uh, benefit as much as I think they will. So thank you. May I say two or three things just to quickly wrap up? First, each of our panelists, thank you. Our panelists have kindly agreed that if the audience would like, they may submit questions. Or I will send out a, uh, an email that says, thank you for participating. You can submit your questions back to REI. We will pass them on to the panelists who can respond to you directly if they choose and are able to, or it may be that they need to pass the question along to one of their colleagues. Um, second, we would like to invite you to suggest topics for future government IT breakfast forum events. Uh, the topic here was pretty clear. It was kind of what are career paths and opportunities and what skills are needed, but we're interested in what the audience, both students as well as government IT professionals is interested in hearing about. Uh, and last, uh, just a separate plug, on March 10th, in about uh, two weeks, uh, REI Systems and George Washington University will host a grants management breakfast forum with the results of our annual grants survey. So those of you who are interested in government grants uh, are certainly welcome to tune into that. And again, you can contact REI Systems for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.